Hi, my name is Sam Buss. This is the first of four lectures in the Proof Complexity Morning for the Satisfiability Bootcamp held at the Simons Institute. Um, in this lecture, we'll discuss introductory topics, including Frege proofs and then abstract proof systems, then resolution, and then finally extended re resolution and extended Frege systems. To start off with the really introductory material, let's describe what propositional formulas are. So for propositional formulas, or sometimes called Boolean formulas, variables range over true-false values, and we denote variables x, y, z, or sometimes p and q. A literal is either a variable or the negation of a variable. Uh, we could either write that as a not x or with overline to mean negation. So overline x means the same thing as not x and double overline x is actually just the same as x. In general, we're going to form our propositional formulas from connectives, starting with either variables or literals, allowing connectives such as and, and or, or if then, or not. And I'll use lowercase Greek letters like phi and psi to describe formulas. And one special case of formulas are the so-called conjunctive normal form formulas, CNF formulas, or disjunctive normal form formulas, DNF formulas. A conjunctive normal form formula is a formula which is expressible as an and of ors of literals. A, a DNF formula is a formula which is a or of ands of literals. A uh, very crucial concept for us is the notion of a satisfiable formula or an unsatisfiable formula. In particular, we define a formula to be a tautology if every truth assignment makes phi true. So a truth assignment means assigning true-false valuables to the variables. Then we evaluate the truth value of the formula using the usual meaning of connectives, such as and, or, if, then, and not. And a tautology is one where no matter how we assign truth values to the variables, phi evaluates to true. In this case, we also say phi is valid. A formula is satisfiable if there's some truth assignment that makes phi true. And an elementary observation is that phi is unsatisfiable if only if not phi is valid or is a tautology. The point being that phi is unsatisfiable means no truth assignment makes phi true, and therefore every truth assignment makes not phi true, and therefore not phi is a tautology. And it's a classic result due to Steve Cook that it's NP hard and even NP complete to determine the satisfiability of a formula phi, and it's co-NP complete to determine the validity of a formula phi. Um, Steve actually showed that it's NP complete and thus NP hard to determine the satisfiability of a conjunctive normal form formula, uh, and it's also NP hard to determine the validity of a DNF formula, and so it's co-NP complete to do that. Now, one of the crucial tasks in computer science and many things is to establish satisfiability or unsatisfiability of a formula. So one way to establish satisfiability is to give a satisfying assignment. So this is like a small witness. It shows that satisfiability is NP. For unsatisfiability, one way to establish unsatisfiability is to give a proof of not phi. So a proof of not phi establishes that not phi is valid, is a tautology. And thus the phi is unsatisfiable. So this lets us turn to proof systems to talk about establishing unsatisfiability. So the first proof system here is Frege proof systems, and this one will be a proof system that proves formulas as compared to a proof system which refutes formulas. Uh, it's a Frege proof system, also denoted with, a, with an F sign, is a textbook style propositional proof system. And I'll take it to have modus ponens as its only rule of inference for the moment. Variables range over true false values. The connectives can be, for instance, not, and, or, and if then. Modus ponens is then the rule of inference from phi and phi implies psi. You can infer psi. And the standard axiomatization, uh, one of them is listed here. There's many possible axiomatizations. So here's the first five standard axiom schemes for a commonly used Frege system. The first one says that phi implies psi implies phi, which if then groups from right to left. So that means that 
V implies the formula psi implies V. And the next four formulas also mean uh, similar things, like the last one is V and psi implies psi. And it's easy to check that no matter how you substitute in formulas for V and psi, the resulting formulas listed here as an axiom scheme are valid. They're always true. And it's called a scheme because it's a framework where you can substitute any formula for phi, psi, and, and chi in the second axiom. Now, this system F, although I didn't fully define it, is sound and complete. In fact, it's implicationally sound and implicationally complete. So let me say what these mean. A form of F is sound means that whenever you have a Frege proof of a formula phi, phi is valid. So the Frege system only proves valid formulas. It's complete in that any valid formula phi has a Frege proof. There's also a stronger notions of soundness and completeness known as implicational soundness and implicational completeness. Uh, so in this case, we assume we have a set of formulas gamma and we use the formulas in gamma as a set of hypotheses. And then given the gamma formulas as, as initial formulas, the formula phi as a proof in the Frege system from those hy hypotheses, if and only if phi is logically implied by the hypotheses. So this symbol here, gamma double turn style phi, means that any truth assignment that makes Every formula in gamma true also makes V true. Uh, these are um, very basic theorems. The soundness theorems are almost immediate from the fact that the inferences are chosen so as to preserve truth, and the axiom schemes are chosen to be valid. And for a completeness theorem, we can formalize the method of truth tables within a Frege proof. In other words, a Frege proof can try out all possible truth assignments and verify that a formula is true under all of them. So I should add here as a side remark that although I discussed one Frege system as listed on the previous slide, in fact, there's a whole family of Frege systems. You can take any finite complete set of Boolean connectives and any finite set of axiom schemes and rule schemes. And assuming that those axioms and rules provide an implicationally sound and implicationally complete system, we call it a Frege proof system. So we are interested in the complexity of proofs, and our most common way of measuring the complexity of proofs is what we call size. And the size of a proof, in particular the size of a Frege proof, is the number of symbols in the proof. And we write F single turn style M phi to mean that phi has a Frege proof of size m, a Frege proof with at most m symbols. And then the size of a formula written with absolute value signs, the size of the formula is the number of symbols in formula. Now, as just mentioned on the previous slide, every tautology has a Frege proof. However, the proof method that we used for the completeness was to use the method of truth tables. And method of truth tables meant going through all possible truth assignments and checking that each one made phi true. There's, in general, a formula phi of size n may have nearly n, or some small constant times n, many different variables. So there may be close to exponential, or two to some small constant times n, many truth assignments. So this completeness theorem gives us exponential size proofs in general. And as a fundamental and very important open question, is, is there a polynomial P of n such that every tautology phi has a Frege proof of size less than or equal to P of n, where n is the size of phi? Such a, in, if this holds, we would call Frege polynomially bounded. So again, the completeness proof showed the existence of exponential size proofs for valid formulas. The open problem is, is there a fixed polynomial such that all, formula, all valid formulas of size n have a Frege proof of size less than or equal to p of n. Uh, as it turns out, the answer is the same for all ways of, all different ways of formalizing Frege systems. We happen to use modus ponens and a particular set of 10 axiom schemes, but it wasn't all that important that we use that particular set of axiom schemes because 
all, all different Frege systems P simulate each other in the sense I'll describe next, meaning that a proof in one type of Frege system can be transformed into a proof in a different Frege system. So this brings up the notion of measuring the sizes of proofs in a more abstract way. So this definition's due to Cook and Cook and Reckel. An abstract proof system is a polynomial time function f mapping the set of binary strings, 0, 1 star, onto the set of tautologies. So when we're defining an abstract proof system, we fix a language in the sense of a set of Boolean connectives, a finite set of Boolean connectives. And we now want a polynomial time function which maps strings over 0, 1 onto the set of tautologies. A f proof, now this is lowercase f, w, is a Boolean string such that little f of w is phi. So in other words, we the image of f is the set of tautologies. Uh, the pre-image of a tautology is a proof of that tautology. The size of the proof w is the number of binary symbols, zero, one, zeros and ones in w, the length of w. Now, this sounds like a fairly non-intuitive way to define a proof system, but let's, it's also a very general way. And in particular, let's look at how to describe the Frege proof system as an abstract proof system. We define a function f sub f, little f sub frega of w, to be the following. If the last line of w is the formula, is a formula phi, and if w is a valid frega proof, then f sub f of w is equal to the last line of w. If w is not a valid frega proof, or not an encoding of a valid frega proof, then we'll just punt, as it were, choose some arbitrary variable x and let f sub f of w be the tautology x or not x. So it's clear that f sub f is a proof system. It always outputs tautologies, and since every tautology has a Frege proof, every tautology is in the range of f sub f. Uh, it's also clear that this didn't depend very much on the Frege system f. It's a very abstract way to describe it. And so, for instance, you could take very strong systems, such as ZF set theory, as an abstract proof system. And basically, the way this would work is you would have F sub ZF would take in a string W. If it's an encoding of a valid ZF proof of the statement, quote, V is a tautology in some appropriate encoding of that statement, then F sub ZF of W would output V. So extremely strong proof systems can be de defined. Um, and, but observation due to Cook and Reckow and is there's a polynomially bounded abstract proof system if and only if NP equals co-NP. So the, the proof idea for this theorem is based on the fact that the set of tautologies is co-NP complete. So if NP equals co-NP, then you can take an NP representation of the tautologies uh, as accepted by some non-deterministic polynomial time Turing machine. And you can let accepting computations of that Turing machine serve as proofs in the abstract proof system. Right. Conversely, if the, the set of tautologies all have short proofs, you can let those short proofs serve as witnesses of membership in the co-NP complete set of tautologies. So that's that's the proof sketch in a nutshell, and this proves the, the theorem that there's some polynomially bounded abstract proof system if and only if NP equals co-NP. A few more basic definitions. If F and G are abstract proof systems, we say that F simulates G if there is a polynomial Q of N such that whenever g of some string w equals some formula phi, then there's a v such that v is polynomially bounded, or the length of v is polynomially bounded by the length of w, and such that f of v equals w, equal, f of v equals phi. 
Intuitively, this means that any G proof of phi, any G proof W of phi, can be con converted into an F proof of phi with size only polynomially larger. Now, simulates doesn't say anything about how you would get V from W. There's another notion of F P simulates G. If there's a polynomial time computable function H of W, such that whenever g of w equals phi, we have f of h of w equals phi. In other words, we have a polynomial time method to get the f proof v of phi. And to repeat an earlier definition, is f is polynomially bounded if for some polynomial q of n, every tautology phi has a f proof of size less than or equal to q of the length of phi. So between simulate and p-simulate, we have a way of measuring the relative strengths of proof systems in terms of the lengths of their proofs. So as I already mentioned, item one here, any two Frege proof systems p-simulate each other. Uh, you have a little bit of care needs to be taken with this statement if they use different languages, but you can make sense out of this by having a natural way of translating formulas in one language into the other language. It's also open whether there's any abstract proof system which simulates or p-simulates all abstract proof systems, uh, and it's open whether there's a polynomially bounded abstract proof system. Just to mention in passing one result here about abstract proof systems, these maximality of abstract proof systems, a theorem of Krychek and Pudlock is that if exponential time is equal to non-deterministic exponential time, then there's an abstract proof system which p-simulates every abstract proof system. And if non-deterministic exponential time is closed under complement, then there's an abstract proof system which simulates every abstract proof system. So to put a little bit of history in here, a lot of what I've talked about so far is what's known as Cook's program uh, from the work of Steve Cook and Robert Reckow. Um, Cook's program can be loosely stated as let's try to prove NP is not equal to co-NP by proving there's no polynomially bounded propositional proof system. So this was formulated in the mid 70s and here's a, a, a chart taken from Robert's Reckhouse PhD thesis showing the state of the art back then. So in this picture, there's a dashed line here and there's a bunch of systems below the dashed line starting with the method of truth tables and moving upward through analytic tableau and the Davis-Putnam procedure and regular re resolution, which I'll define those later. And above the dashed line were systems such as the cut free Genson system, resolution, Frege systems, which I've talked about, and resolution with extension, which I'll talk about later in the talk. And at, in the mid 70s, mid 70s, the state of the art was that the systems below the dashed line were known to not be poly polynomially bounded in that we had examples of propositional formulas that were valid but required super polynomially, super polynomially long proofs in these systems. And the systems above the, the line, it was open whether or not they were polynomially bounded or not. So here's an update to pretty much the current state of knowledge. I took this from a 2015 talk, but no systems have moved across any lines here. Um, here is a bunch of, the, the dashed line has moved up to the red shorter dashed line. And in the meantime, Genson systems without cut and resolution had both been shown to not be polynomially bounded. And I'll talk about the result for re resolution in this part B of this series of talks. Also, in the meantime, a bunch of other systems have come in to study. There's the constant depth Frege systems, uh, where you have constant alternations of ands and ors. There's constant depth Frege systems with some mod m counting axioms. There's a system known as cutting planes, and other algebraic systems known as Nullstellensatz and polynomial calculus. And uh, cutting planes works with line linear integer inequalities. Nullstellensatz and pol polynomial calculus deal with equations over fields. And these will get discussed in part D of this talk. But all of these systems, I wrote them here below the dashed red line, are known not to be polynomially bounded. Uh, there's some citations here. Um, it's a 
bit out of date. There's been quite a bit of work on these systems since 2015, especially the bottom three, cutting planes, Nostellensens, and Paul Lemieux calculus. But this is sort of where we are with the Cook's program here. The minute we hit Frege systems, which you'll see sitting right here, we no longer know whether or not the system is polynomially bounded, and it's entirely possible to our current state of knowledge that every tautology has a polynomial size proof in a Frege system. So this whole notion of simulations and p-simulations is very natural. It makes a nice hierarchy, a, a kind of a lattice on propositional proof systems and gives you a good way to compare the strength of proof systems. But they suffer in applications from the fact that they do not account for the difficulty of searching for proofs. In satisfiability, we're often interested not just in some sort of theoretical thing about does a proof exist, but can we find it? And the difficulty of this proof search process is often more important than bounds on the lengths of proofs. So in, indeed, it's often preferable to search for proofs in a weaker system that admits effective proof search procedures than to search for proofs in a stronger system where there may be shorter proofs. So a prime example of this, and it forms the foundation for a huge number of automated theorem proving stuff, especially in the domain of satisfiability, is the system resolution and some of its subsystems. These re resolution is weaker in the sense of simulation than something like Frege systems, but it will be easier to search for proofs in resolution than it is to search for proofs in a Frege proof system. So resolution, I'll go pretty fast on this since I think most of the audience to these slides knows this. Resolution is a so-called refutation system. It refutes sets of clauses. That is, it shows that the set of clauses is unsatisfiable. A clause, a set of clauses, is the same thing as a conjunctive normal form formula. Each clause is a disjunction of literals. The set of clauses is the and of those clauses. And so when we refute a CNF formula, this is the same thing as proving that a DNF formula is a tautology. So remember, showing that a CNF formula is unsatisfiable is the same thing as showing its negation, namely a DNF formula is valid. So we can either view resolution as a refutation system for CNF formulas or a proof system for DNF formulas. So to give the formal definition of resolution, a literal is either a variable or a negated variable. A clause is a set of literals interpreted as their disjunction, as their or. A set gamma of clauses is a CNF formula. And there's one rule of inference which is from x or c and from not x or d, we can infer c or d. So here I'm writing clauses as sets. Uh, commas can be interpreted as either and or union. And uh, so if we have two clauses as hypotheses. They, one contains x, the other contains x bar, not x. And we resolve on the variable x, removing x and keeping the rest of the clauses. A resolution refutation then is a derivation starting with clauses in gamma that ends up with the empty clause. The empty clause is the empty disjunction. The empty disjunction is the same thing as the constant false. So in this way, if we can derive the constant false from a set of clauses, it cannot be possible to, to simultaneously satisfy all the clauses in the set gamma. So, well-known fact, and pretty basic for this, is that resolution is sound and complete um, for, of course, refuting sets of clauses. So soundness is not hard uh, to, to prove. Um, for You just can prove that in, in a resolution inference, if the conclusion is false under some truth assignment, then one of the hypotheses is false under some truth assignment. For completeness, you can use the Davis-Putnam procedure. So this was... Um, this was introduced by a paper by Davis and Putnam in 1960. Um, also, the paper that it was not the first time resolution was defined, that was in the 1920s, but it was started the modern use of resolution. Now, the Davis-Putnam procedure is the following. You choose one variable as your resolution variable. You look at all the clauses that contain either x or not x. You resolve all possible pairs of these clauses together. Uh, you obtain clauses that don't contain x or not x. And then we 
discard, once we finish that, we discard the clauses that contained x or not x, and then we iterate choosing another variable and doing the same thing. Um, this procedure can certainly take exponential time to carry out, and but it, it will, if a, the original set of clauses is unsatisfiable, it will, in, in the end, eliminate all variables ending up with an empty clause. Um, this is for refutations, resolution. This theorem, first theorem, was for refutations. Re resolution is a refutation system. There's also a kind of completeness theorem for deriving clauses. Namely, if gamma logically implies C, and that should really be a double turnstile there, there is a subclause D of C and there's a resolution derivation of D from gamma. In other words, there's a sequence of resolution inferences that takes you starting with clauses in gamma and produces the clause D. And this second theorem can also be proved via the Davis-Putnam procedure, namely resolving on all variables that do not occur in C one at a time. So one more definition that will be useful later on is a regular resolution proof. A, for this, a resolution derivation can be viewed as a sequence of clauses, and each clause, as we've discussed, is either a hypothesis, that's an input clause from the set I called gamma, or is inferred by resolution from earlier clauses. And as a sequence of clauses of this type, it defines a, a DAG, a directed acyclic graph, on the clauses in the derivation. And the uh, definition, going back to Satan, 68, uh, who was one of the first ones to talk about complexity proofs in this setting, a resolution refutation is regular if there's no path in the refutation DAG on which the same variable is resolved on more than once. And a theorem, not hard to show, is that regular resolution is complete. In fact, the Davis-Putnam procedure just outlined on the previous slide gives regular refutations. Um, so regular resolution comes up as a tool in many practical proof search things, and we'll see this in a later talk. Uh, but it is weaker than res resolution. This took some time to be proved, but um, in about 2002, Leknovich, Johansson, Potassi, and Urquhart proved that regular resolution does not simulate resolution. In other words, there are some unsatisfiable sets of clauses such that their shortest resolution refutation is much shorter than their shortest regular resolution refutation. So let's return to how to do resolution as an abstract proof system. So I was talking about resolution as a proof system for DNF formulas, a refutation system for CNF formulas, hence a proof system for DNF formulas. But the way we define abstract proof systems is supposed to be a proof system for all propositional formulas. And resolution can't use all propositional formulas. Each line in a resolution refutation or resolution derivation is a clause. Each clause is just a disjunction but we're sort of implicitly maintaining a big set of clauses. So at each point, resolution has a set of clauses that it's working with. So it's working with a CNF formula, but it's not working with an arbitrary propositional formula with ands and ors arbitrarily nested. So Satan proposed a method to take care of this, the so-called extension rule. So extension lets you uh, add a new variable which is an abbreviation for a previous formula. So formally, we take two literals x and y, and we let z be a new variable that hasn't been used anywhere, and we introduce z as an abbreviation, as it were, for the formula x and y by adding three new clauses. We take x bar, y bar, z, z bar, x, and z bar, y. So this means z bar y means the same as not z or y, hence z implies y. z bar x means z implies x. And x bar y bar z means not x or not y or z, which means the same thing as x and y implies z. Hence, these three clauses mean the same thing as z if and only if x and y. And a dual construction works fine to introduce x or y. So 
If we want to view resolution as an abstract proof system, if we're given a propositional formula phi, let's assume it's fully parenthesized, we introduce clauses for all the extension variables z sub phi that represent the subformulas phi, uh, z sub psi, sorry, all the extension variables z sub psi that represent the subformula psi of phi. So in other words, starting with the smallest subformula psi and working our way up to the entire formula phi, we introduce z sub psi as being either the conjunction or disjunction of two earlier variables or two earlier literals. Um, and in this way, we introduce exactly what's needed to represent the subformulas of phi with variables. And then if we take the following set of clauses, we have the, the clauses in gamma, the new extension variable that define the new extension variables, and the singleton clause, not z of phi. This, not z sub phi, this expresses the negation of phi. And then we can say that a resolution proof of phi is the same thing as a resolution reputation of a singleton, not z sub phi, and the set of clauses gamma. So Satan introduced the extension rule as a way to, um, to talk about resolution as a proof system for arbitrary propositional formulas. But resolution rule, or the extension rule, is also just a very useful rule in its own right. And when we add this, we get a system known as extended resolution. Um, and we'll also add it to Frege systems and get extended Frege's and get extended proof, extended Frege proofs. So the proof system extended resolution is resolution where you augment the unrestricted use of the extension rule. In other words, not just using extension for subformulas of the formula phi to be proved, but allowing the use of the extension rule for any formula. And so this means at any point in the proof, we can take some existing literals x and y pick a new variable z and introduce the three clauses expressing that z is equivalent to x and y. In the Frege system, we have a more general way of doing the same thing. The extension rule for the Frege system allows introducing new variables standing for arbitrary formulas. So at any point in a Frege proof, we can have a, as a new formula appearing in the proof, we can have the formula z if and only if phi. And this is probably an abbreviation for z implies phi and phi implies z, since that was the connectives I was using for the Frege proof system. But we get a formula expressing this property. Z has to be a new variable in the sense it's not been used anywhere in the earlier part of the proof. It does not appear in the formula phi, and nor does it appear in the last line of the proof. And this then gives the notion of extended Frege systems. And a fairly intuitive theorem, at least, is that extended resolution and extended Frege P simulate each other, in that any extended resolution proof can be translated into an extended Frege proof, and conversely, any extended Frege proof can be translated into an extended re re resolution proof. And these translations can be carried out feasibly in polynomial time. And the, the general idea of transforming an extended Frege proof into an extended re resolution proof is just as follows. The extended Frege proof can have complex formulas. It may not just have um, clauses, for instance. But what we can do is we can introduce, for every complex formula in the extended Frege proof, we can introduce a new variable. And then the extended resolution can work with the new variables and keep the uh, size of the formulas simple. Now, there's a nice way to understand extended Frege proof complexity in terms of Frege proof complexity. But we're going to relate the size of extended Frege proofs to the number of steps or the number of formulas, the number of lines in a Frege proof. So earlier we defined proof size V dash M to mean proof size measured in terms of the number of symbols appearing in the proof. We can also measure proof size in terms of the numbers of inference steps denoted, I'll just V dash 
m steps. And so this means that there's m steps in the proof or m distinct lines or n distinct occurrences of formulas in the proof. And um, my theorem of Statman is that if we have a Frege proof with m steps of a formula phi, then that same formula phi has an extended Frege proof of size linear in m and the length of phi squared. So it's order m plus the length of phi squared. And the general idea for this proof is as follows. If f has m steps in it, it could have very long formulas in it, thus making a large size. But if we could keep the proof to have m steps but keep all the formulas small, then uh, while getting an extended Frege proof, then we get the bound we want. So the idea is to introduce, whenever we look at the Frege proof, and whenever it starts introducing large formulas, we reduce the size of those large formulas by introducing new variables using extension to stand for its subformulas. And by carrying this idea out carefully, you can get that the m steps of the Frege proof turn into order m steps, order m symbols, I should say, an extended Frege proof, that is order m steps, but each line has constantly many symbols. The length of phi squared term is because in the end, you have to unwind phi to get rid of the extension variables representing the subformulas of phi. And that could, in the worst case, bring in quadratically many symbols. Another way to think about Frege versus extended Frege is in terms of Boolean formulas versus Boolean circuits. So with the a Frege proof, looking at this first bullet point here, is a proof in which each line is a Boolean formula or propositional formula. We can view an extended Frege proof as a proof in which each line is a Boolean circuit. And the point is, if you have a Boolean circuit, that means instead of it being a formula, it's a directed acyclic graph. Uh, the inputs to the graph are variables. The nodes inside the graph are Boolean gates. And uh, we can introduce an extension variable for each gate in the circuit and thus get a polynomial size way of representing the valid the value of the circuit uh, by defining the value of the circuit with an extension variable uh, that using iteratively the extension rule to define the value of each gate. So in this way, we get the intuition that we, a Frege proof is a proof in which each line is a Boolean formula, and extended Frege proof is a proof in which each line is a Boolean circuit. You can make this intuition rigorous, and Emily Robick has done so in a system called Circuit Frege, but I'm going to skip that here and just remark that we have two conjectures that are made, one on the complexity side and the other on the proof complexity side. The first conjecture is that Boolean circuits cannot be converted into polynomial size Boolean formulas, or into equivalent polynomial size Boolean formulas. Uh, the second conjecture is that Frege systems do not simulate or p-simulate extended Frege systems. And um, the, these are somehow analogous because it seems like Frege and extended Frege proofs reason respectively about Boolean formulas and Boolean circuits. So it's tempting to say that these conjectures should be equivalent, but there's actually no known direct connection between these conjectures. On one hand, formulas might be able to poly polynomially represent circuits, but this conversion of circuits into polynomial size formulas may not be provable with Frege proofs. So even though things are expressible, we may not be able to prove the properties that we need. Conversely, there might be some completely different other method for Frege to assimilate extended Frege that does not involve converting circuits to formulas. So neither of these possibilities can be ruled out. Nonetheless, it makes a nice way to think about and to motivate Frege versus extended Frege proofs. So our current state of the art, just to run through some review here, is any two Frege proof systems p-simulate each other. Um, likewise, any two extended Frege proof systems p-simulate each other. It's clear, just trivially, that extended Frege systems p-simulate Frege systems. It, on the other hand, it's open whether Frege systems simulate extended Frege systems. It's open whether either of these systems is polynomially bounded. I uh, already mentioned that extended resolution extended Frege systems p-simulate each other. It's 
should be clear that Frege systems p-simulate re re resolution. On the other hand, and we'll see later, that resolution does not simulate Frege systems, and already mentioned that regular resolution does not simulate resolution. So in the talks going forward, in particular, the next two talks are Part B and Part C, and they can be watched independently of each other. Part B will discuss what's known about separating resolution Frege and extended Frege systems, especially using the Pigeon principle. And Part C will discuss resolution and its subsystems and how they relate to conflict-directed uh, conflict clause learning, CDCL, proof search. And Part D will discuss yet further proof systems. So this is the end of Part A. And before you depart, let me just mention there's several survey articles available to read, um, including one that the very top one there that's just coming out, I think approximately this month uh, in early 2021 uh, by Jakob Nordstrom and myself on proof complexity.